Hey everybody, Stax here. Welcome back to the channel, guys. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, hit the bell for notifications, and all that stuff. I'm, today I'm talking about uh, doing something a little bit different. And I'm switching my perspective a little bit to, hey, we're, we're five issues in on X-Men, six issues in on everything out, but looking out towards the long game and some of the storylines that Jonathan Hickman is putting in place that are eventually gonna mature into well-developed storylines. He, he's talked before about laying breadcrumbs. And you saw this a lot back when Chris Claremont, when he first uh, really started after Giant Size X-Men. And you started seeing the introduction of a, an influx of new characters and new ideas and new enemies and new new relationships. And you just saw all this stuff start to, to develop. And it led to storylines for years and years and years. And I think you're seeing... Uh, Jonathan Hickman do something similar in this first, I mean, he's only six issues into this. Well, five issues for X-Men, six issues for everything else from Dawn of X, and then, of course, the 12 from House of X and Powers of Ten. And this especially became present in, um, I think, issue two from, from Powers of X. Um, the six issues, uh, the sixth issue, both House and Powers, and then mainly the X-Men title has been where you've gotten the majority of these of these seeds being planted for future use. Um, we have a lot of old threats being reintroduced. We have we've seen the rise of you know, this biological plant-based technology and it, it really mirrors the Sentinel program and the advancement of going from the the Sentinel to the uh, to the master mold, to the mother mold, to to eventually you know becoming sentient and becoming Nimrod. But really, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, what I want to do is just discuss some of these breadcrumbs, these future storylines, and speculate on the storylines that can grow out of these. The biggest thread out there has to be Moira, Moira but it, but I'll discuss her later. So let's start with some of the threads that have have yet to be pulled from House of X. So the one of the biggest ones from House of X that really stands out to me is Mystique and the promise made to her by Charles and Eric that they would resurrect Destiny. And you know, she's a high ranking member, she's on the Quiet Council and they're telling her, yeah, we're gonna get to that. Well, it should, she's gonna eventually say, why isn't this a priority? And she's gonna put two and two together that they don't want precogs on the island because they don't want people to know what they're doing. Destiny, of course, is a precog, and she can see right through to the end state of Krakoa and Moira's master plan. And that poses a big issue because right now the world thinks that the human, not mutant Moira McTaggart is dead. She isn't, of course, but the brain trust has you know has, has faked her death, and now she hangs out on the nowhere of Krakoa undetected even by Krakoa itself or any of the telepaths, you know, stomping around up on the island. You know, another reason is that the last time Destiny and Moira spoke, it, let's just say it didn't end well. You know, Destiny ended up directing Pyro to send Moira to her next life in a way that she would not forget and she was burned alive. As far as my speculation on this, you don't want to make an enemy of Mystique. Which is, honestly, it's a shame she's not on a team right now that's being written about. Uh, she would fit great on X-Force. Her power set would fit perfect for Marauders as far as getting behind enemy lines and being able to help extract those those um, mutants from those countries. But I digress. Mystique is not going to wait forever. Being a member of the Council, she knows the inner workings of the Five. And she has, you know, assuming... Uh, she she has influence here. I could see her just straight out calling out Professor X and Magneto during a meeting of the council and saying, look, this has been promised to me. Why isn't this being actioned? What are you hiding? Just right there in front of the council and everybody. And she, she may get tired of no and just take matters into her own hands. And if she does, the lies she reveals could seriously destabilize Krakoa, could create a schism, and lead to a whole mutant civil war, or perhaps some mutants just deciding to leave the island because they don't believe that they can trust the government, that they can trust Professor Xavier and Magneto in this leadership anymore. And of course, if she needs an ally, if she needs somebody that, to strike against the Quiet Council, she doesn't have to look very far other than down in that pit where Victor Creed is hanging out, Sabretooth. 
Hashtag free Victor Creed. Sabretooth is our, our second unexplored threat, and that started all the way back in House of X 1 when he was captured by the Fantastic Four following that mission to steal information on the Orcus base. He was then following the formation of the Quiet Council and the establishment of the Krakoan government. He was convicted of a crime using a law that wasn't even a law when he committed the crime. His crime basically equated to he didn't listen to Magneto, so he ended up in a hole. Now, it has been rumored that Sabretooth will be in the Wolverine uh, solo series, but I that's just completely rumor at this point as far as I know. The um, We'll have to wait to see, but Creed is definitely a wild card. He's, he's unpredictable, he has an undeniable bloodlust, and he will not bend the knee. And now, I know at times he's turned over a new leaf, but... This Sabretooth has a bone to pick with every single member on that council right now because of what happened to him. Switching gears a little bit, as I mentioned earlier, Jonathan Hickman's X-Men are making new enemies along the way. And while she was no friend to mutant kind during House of X and Powers of X, Dr. Gre uh, Gregor is motivated now more than ever to destroy the mutants. Working for Orcus and the guy that's only been named, as far as I know, as the director, she is a brilliant scientist who lost her husband when he turned Suicide Bomber to stop Cyclops and his team, their, their mission to uh, destroy the Mother Mold. While his attack did manage to injure Nightcrawler and kill Angel and Husk, he was ultimately unsuccessful I mean, when, you, when you put measures to it because they still lost the Mother Mold. But left behind, his wife was stricken with grief and in her grief, she may have unlocked technology very similar to what the mutant resurrection protocols are doing because at the end of X-Men 1, she made the proclamation that she believes she can bring him back while holding a gem that looked very similar to the, the Nimrod crystal. As far as speculation on this, it this just amplifies this mutant versus humans arms race that just keeps rushing towards you know mutually ensured destruction. The big question going forward on the human side is going to be on scale. Is how fast and how many can they resurrect? And are they going to bind themselves to any of the ethical protocols that the mutants have? I mean, the good news is that it doesn't seem like um, another newly introduced antagonist in uh, Exeno. It doesn't seem like they could take advantage of that stuff because most of that is like aftermarket bolt-on accessories. It's not genetic mutations at this point. They're still having to take people, tear them down basically to a nervous system, and then build them back up, adding you know weapons and capabilities and blasting caps on their teeth and you know bones between their uh, their in their forearms and all that other stuff. But one way that these two combined can take advantage of that is not restricting themselves on the cloning. They basically make it full-blown cloning and they, where you have multiple copies of each person in the program. And if you think about the current protocol on the mutant side, it's, you know, you, your body gets put back in your husk. But is there, does it have to be that way? Can they get a, here's the, you know, the copy that we use on everybody and that, and we put it in every husk and we have an army of, you know, clones basically. Getting away from that a little bit, though, I did want to talk about the fact that they had a giant back in X-Force, I think, number four at one, at one of their labs. So first, I'll ask how, but I also have to ask why. The advantage of their other engineered soldiers and assassins is that they blend into the general population. They can, and not so much with this guy. This guy was like three stories tall, and unless Xeno is planning a large-scale assault against Krakoa, that maximizes the use of power dampening tech, I don't see that these guys would provide any advantage at all other than being really large targets for Cyclops to blast holes through. I mean, that is unless they are used in tangent with like another emerging threat. And then the one I thought of was horticulture. Now don't get me wrong here, I know absolutely a ton of people hated uh, X-Men number three, the, the golden girls that whipped Cyclops and Sebastian Shaw, because, I mean, look, they they, they, jump, they got jumped by the Golden Girls, right? But it's not like they it was a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight. They caught them by surprise. They hit them with a power dampening substance of some kind and disabled them and then they kicked their tail, right? 
Um, regardless, the horticulture ladies are one of the biggest threats to Krakoa, in my opinion, because they can provide uh, what no one else can to this point, and no one's been able to replicate that, and it's unrestricted access to Krakoa. Even when uh, Zeno ordered and carried out this assassination of Professor Xavier, they, you know, Black Tom Cassidy and Sage, they detected those assassins arriving, but they just assumed they were dominoes because she had, uh, she had the, um, or they had her skin basically grafted into their own. Horticulture is beyond that. They can completely take over the Krakoan gate network and use them to transport non-mutants. They, they did it back in X-Men number three. So what they are, I mean, so what that they're a bunch of geriatric old women? Who cares, right? That's, that's not the threat. The threat is the access and selling that possibly or working with another group like Xeno, or Xeno to attack Krakoa. If they helped coordinate attack using, you know, power dampening tech and these uh, Xeno assassins and and giant, I mean, throw some of those giants in there. If you if you have power dampening tech, they're a lot more effective. You could have an, another mutant massacre on your hands. I mean, call me crazy, but it would actually be pretty cool if if you were heading this way and this was happening, and you had, of course, you have heroic moments on the island. Um, it's not like Forge's tech won't stop working because it's still um, you can still use that biological tech that he has. And you could still have a fight, but you would have mutants that are basically able to sacrifice themselves, have meaningful moments, because they don't know if the five is going to survive or not. But right when it's getting down to the point where the five are being threatened, or where it's it's getting to the point where the mutants are losing, you know, that help signal that was sent out earlier, suddenly you have like the Avengers show up, or you know, you have the Fantastic Four show up. You have somebody else show up that helps save them. And just kind of helps build that bridge that, you know, that Professor X is talking about. That there's still hope, and they still have hope in humanity. One of the moments, like, from a, from a writer's standpoint that would pop in my mind is Black Tom Cassidy with zero powers, no powers, sitting there when a couple of those assassins come into the room where Professor Xavier is. And him holding that Cerebro sword and just being like you're not getting by me you know you're you will not pass kind of moment and just knowing that he can't stop these guys but just swearing up and down that he's not going to let the professor fall again and knowing he's willing to die to make that happen but back to the point i was trying to make basically horticulture they they already have access to the krakoan gateways and they made off with some of the plants so it's going to be interesting to see where they pop up again and what they're able to do with that. Guys, this is basically gonna end up as part one and probably a, a two or three part series on these rising threats and these different uh, storylines that can come out of the first six I issues of Dawn of X. Make sure you're subscribed and hit the bell for notification. In the next one, I'm gonna talk um, Mr. Sinister. I'm gonna talk the Horsemen of the Apocalypse. I'm gonna talk the, the Summoners. And, and a lot more. So make sure you're subscribed. Hit the bell for notifications. Leave a like if you enjoyed this, guys. And as always, leave a comment below. Tell me what you think. What is your speculation on some of the stuff I discussed here today? And guys, I hope you have a great week. That's all I got. Real Comics Stacks. Out.